Hello and welcome to Mel Make Stuff. My name is Melissa and this is the first video in my series about knitting and crocheting from Japanese patterns. I'm separating this out from my typical episodes because I feel like this is maybe a little bit more niche. Not everyone will be interested in this, but if you are, welcome. This is basically just going to be me taking you with me as I work through these patterns with little to no Japanese ability. I'll be working through how I plan to grade or size these patterns up so that they'll fit me and any yarn substitutions that I may or may not be making. This isn't going to be a super in-depth tutorial on how to read Japanese patterns, although we will go over that in a second, just sort of an overview. Uh, but I will link a resource down below that I used, which is like a blog post that gives some useful kanji to know and just some information about how to read the decrease. Uh, there's a specific system for how decreases tend to be written for areas like the armhole and things like that. So that will be linked down below. It's also not going to be a tutorial on how to grade patterns uh, up necessarily. I'm just going to be talking to you about the choices that I'm making and choices that you may want to consider if you're looking at doing something like this yourself. As far as where to buy these patterns, I typically buy all of my Japanese pattern books on Etsy, so I will be listing the ISBN numbers of any of the books I'm talking about down below in case you want to seek them out there or anywhere else you might buy books. So getting right into it, the book that we are going to be talking about today is one of the most exciting books that I have seen, really, uh, I think ever, is how I'm feeling about it at the moment. This is, uh, sorry for the reflection, it's a shiny cover. Uh, this is a Rowan, a Japanese Rowan book. And so the designers listed here are about half of the book is made up of Japanese designers and then the other half are folks that you might typically see in like a, a UK Rowan lineup like uh, Kay Fassett and Lisa Richardson and a couple others. In this book the pattern names are in English and the designers names are all written out using Latin letters but everything else is in Japanese. The patterns are also written in a Japanese style so they're written for one size, that size is quite small, and uh, they're mostly charted, so not a whole lot of written instructions. So we'll be looking at a Japanese pattern here in just a moment. Before we get to that, I wanna show you some of the amazing designs in this book because I, when I saw this, and I did purchase this on Etsy, a lot of the sellers there will really thoroughly photograph the book so that you can see a lot of the designs that you would be getting. And when I saw some of these, I was so excited that I like freaked out a little bit. I immediately had to order it when I saw the one that I'm going to be showing you today that I've already started. The other thing to note about this book in particular is that because it's a Rowan publication, it is using Rowan yarns. So either the Kid Silk Haze, which is their mohair silk base, or the Felted Tweed, which is like a lightweight DK. And so all of the designs in this book are using those yarns, a combination or one or the other. Just to show you a couple of the beautiful designs, there is this lovely hat which I could see making. I'm really into this Bohus inspired yoke. It's a nice close up of that. This was where I really started to get excited because as you can see, there is some interesting texture in this sweater. This is knitted with the main color. This blue is two strands of Kid Silk Haze held together. And then these little windows, uh, which are intarsia, are knitted with just one strand of mohair. So. I found that to be really interesting. There's this amazing sweater by Erika Tokai, which is the same one on the cover. I have started assembling the yarns for this, but as you can see, there's a lot of different colors here, so that's gonna take me a little bit of time. And then here is the one that pushed me over the edge into buying the book. This is Hypnosis by Mikiko Gasnier. And as soon as I saw this, this was the one that made me freak out. I immediately had to knit this. And so the more you look at it, the more you notice these very interesting details. So you can see that there is maybe a little bit of marling going on through this section. And the way this is actually done is with four, there's only four colors of the Kid Silk Haze used in this design. But we have areas where they're being held double, one color with another, some areas where there's a single strand being used within this intarsia section. And so I saw this and I was like, yep, I'm getting that book. For the yarns, although I really liked the original color palette, those pinks and reds and oranges, I was thinking I might like to make this in a green color palette. So I actually made a special trip out to Webbs so that I could see the colors in person. I live within two hours driving distance of Webbs. So I made a special trip out there to get the colors for this. And so this, the Rowan Kitzel Haze is a very standard 
silk mohair in terms of like the yards per per gram. So you could easily sub in something that, that costs a little bit less. And I considered, you know, I looked at all of the mohair that they had at the store and the colors that I ended up choosing happened to be the kids silk haze, but you could easily sub in almost anything else on the market. So I basically pulled out the original colors so that I could just see them in person and use that as a guide to choose my color palette in green. So the lightest color I chose was mint for the upper body and then that sort of grades into the darkest color which is this rich sort of medium dark green. It's not super dark but I thought that this whole palette was sort of cohesive and so let me show you where I am so far. Here is what I have so far. You can see I've got uh, eight different bobbins going, which is, uh, it's sort of at the point where I really need to be sitting at a table to work on it just because these will get really screwed up if I'm uh, sitting on the couch or have to get up for some reason. So the construction of this sweater is knitted from the bottom up in pieces and seamed. It's a set in sleeve sweater and then the sleeves are picked up and knit from the top down. So the rib section is knitted using one single strand of mohair and I thought that that was going to be like very fiddly and delicate uh, and it is quite delicate but forming a hardier fabric than I thought it would. I am using wooden needles. There is zero way I would try to knit something like this with a metal needle. It would be way too slippery for me. And when you get to the body, you start with the same color you used for the rib, but you hold two strands together here. So it's forming actually quite a thick, pillowy, extremely soft fabric. And so you knit for, you know, a prescribed period of rows and then you start in with your intarsia. And so the way this pattern is written is that you have a separate chart for the back and a separate chart for the front. The pattern is a little bit different on the back than on the front. The color work on the front will actually dip down a bit lower, but they meet up on the sides, which I think is a really nice touch. And just to give you a little bit of a close up here, so there are some areas in here where there is a single strand being held together. You can see I'm sort of playing with both using bobbins and I have uh, pulling from the, both the inside and outside of the ball for one section. And I have just a, a long string hanging for one section that's sort of finishing up here. That's a single strand. And so I know a lot of intarsia knitters will just pull off a couple yards of yarn and leave it hanging at the back of the work. That I think is actually a good uh, way to do intarsia just from the the little experience that I've had so far I do think like even if it causes a mess at the back it is pretty easy to pull out the string that you need but with this particular yarn this will just knot and grab onto itself so readily that if I had more than one free hanging string there I think my life would be miserable so that's why I'm using the bobbins they're a little bit annoying but I think for me at least for this project it's necessary and so here you can just see a little bit of the detail of the color. So this um, bright yellowish green is starting to come in here in combination being held with one of the darker greens that we're grading through. And so I hope this gives you a sense, like you can sort of see the textural differences right here is a section that's being knit with one strand of mohair held singly and up against these sections where the mohair is being held double you can tell that there's a textural difference and actually a gauge difference there which is sort of interesting you can see over here i have some painters tape and a sharpie and i am actually uh, keeping track of my my bobbins that way so all of the color groupings in the pattern are lettered so like you know c is the darkest green held with the the third color right? So the two darker greens held together. So that's just how I'm keeping track of this. Uh, B is two strands of the darkest green held together, etc. So now that you have a sense of how this is going, let us talk about grading. So one of the things that many of us will have to consider when reading from a Japanese pattern is the fact that a lot of them are drafted for this one size that tends to be on the small end of what we're used to seeing in English patterns. One of the things that I don't often see in Japanese knitting patterns is a suggestion of how much ease the model is wearing it with, so you sort of have to make an assumption. I do have a couple of Japanese sewing books in translation that indicate that a lot of patterns are drafted for a Japanese medium size, which is around 83 centimeters. That is between 32 and 33 inches, I think, for the bust. So that is, again, you know, on the smaller side of what one might be used to seeing in an English pattern. So there are a number of things that one might do to grade that up if you want more ease or, you know, if we're talking about really significantly grading it up. 
And so let us look at how Japanese patterns are constructed because I actually think that the way that they're written makes this task a little bit easier than the way English patterns are typically written. So I'm not going to show the pattern from this book because obviously I paid for that, but I did print one off that I found on Ravelry that's free. And so this is it. <laughs> this is the entire pattern. Um, so full disclosure, I have a teeny tiny bit of Japanese reading ability, but it is nothing that uh, I couldn't just use my own eyes to to deduce. <laughs> so like I can see that this right here says Aran no seta right? Aaron sweater. I can also just look at this photo and, and see that this is an Aaron type sweater, right? A cabled sweater. So that's the limit of my Japanese ability, right? I barely know any of these kanji and certainly not to actually be able to read anything. So what you will typically see in a Japanese style pattern is an area where it will tell you the yarn, usually the yarn amount you need in grams. It lets you know what needle sizes you need. Uh, Japanese needle sizes are different from metric and uh, American sizing, and they often fall sort of in between metric sizes. So you'll need to make a choice of whether you want to go up or down sometimes. I'll also have a link below to a Japanese um, knitting needle conversion chart. It will give you the finished bust measurement for the garment. So right here I can see that this finished garment is intended to be a 96 centimeter bust. And it will also give you the gauge here. So you might find both stockinette and pattern gauge. Um, pattern meaning in this instance the cable pattern here. Then up here there will usually be a paragraph of what looks like possibly substantial text, right? But what you will notice if you have an app on your phone, so I use the Google app for this, but I'm sure there are others, you hover your phone over the text and it will translate this for you. It will do its best <laughs> to translate this for you. And what you'll find is that there's not really a whole ton of useful information here that you can't get from looking at these charts. What this section will usually be is just some general guidance about how the pattern is constructed. Like it sort of reads like a, a project description on Ravelry. It'll say uh, this sweater is knit in pieces from the bottom up and then the sleeves are picked up and knit from the top down and you use oftentimes it'll translate a uh, rib as rubber stitch or elastic stitch um, I mean just it's very general stuff you don't really need to know what's going on up here and then we get to the actual pattern so a lot of this is going to be like if you like puzzles and you like context clues and you like sort of figuring out things here and there. The only kanji that I really find useful in this instance are the ones for stitch. So you can see where it says 86 and then there's a little kanji right after it. That's the kanji for stitch. It usually will also give you the measurement in centimeters right next to it. So like you can use your context clues right there to figure out your gauge. And then for the length, this one here where it says 74 and then there's a little kanji afterwards that is the kanji for row and again you can see the measurement there so this will give you it's basically a schematic that also tells you what you're doing you can see arrows that will indicate the direction that you're working so we can see here we're looking at the back because the, the back neck is a little bit higher, right, than your front neck, generally. This is going to be your front. It will indicate the, the pattern stitch. So in this instance, um, your translator app will be useful for this. You can see that the this cable pattern here appears only on the front. The back is in stockinette. The apps will often translate stockinette as just knitting. And then if there's a pattern, it will say pattern knitting. So that's something that you might notice. And then for the sleeves, I can tell that the intent is for the sleeves to either be knitted from the top down and sewn in, or you pick up stitches around the sleeve and knit from the top down. You might be able to get a little bit more clue from your translator app of what the intent is here, but either way, you will be able to get, you know, something like what is going on here. And then the neckline, so the arrow going up indicates, you know, after this is seamed, you pick up your stitches, you knit your neckline out, and then you bind off. So that is a pretty standard way that a Japanese pattern is going to be written. You have your cable charts here, which are usually uh, using very standard knitting symbols that you would recognize without having to look up any sort of translation. So you have your pattern, but you need to figure out how to size it up. There are, I would say, three ways that you might consider doing that. The first one is playing with your gauge, which for me really only works if you are trying to get it just a little bit bigger. 
because, and I want to refer everybody to Mega of Skeins of Dreams recent video where she talks about uh, playing with your gauge to size a pattern uh, because she goes far more in depth into it than I will here. And Mega does a good job of emphasizing this in her video. But essentially when you take a knitted gauge and you decide I want that sweater to be slightly bigger so I am just going to knit it at a larger gauge, what you're doing often when you knit at a larger gauge is really blowing the entire thing up by a certain percentage. So your row gauge is also going to tend to get bigger and that might not be something you want if you just want a little bit more width across the bust or across the shoulders. Also, you would wanna consider the fact that the neckline might be getting too wide and it is something that will take more fiddling with, um, more adjustments if you're trying to go up more than like maybe one size, one or two sizes. The other thing to consider if you are using gauge to play with your sizing is whether the yarn that you've chosen wants to actually be knit at that bigger gauge. And that was the main reason I decided not to use my gauge to make this a little bit bigger because in my instance, so if I'm assuming that this sweater is drafted for an 83 centimeter bust, my bust measurement is 89 centimeters. So I really do sort of just need it to be a little bit bigger in order to get that nice like blousey ease that it's being worn with in the pattern photos. But since I'm using the original yarn suggested in the pattern, what I don't necessarily want to do is be knitting like a single strand of mohair at a looser gauge because it could affect the integrity of the fabric at that point. I don't want the gauge to be looser than recommended. So the second option, which is the one that I chose, is to actually grade the pattern up a little bit. And this is one of those things where if you are already confident grading patterns, you don't need to li listen to my advice about this, right? But so there are a number of considerations when you are thinking about grading a pattern up in terms of adding stitches to get it to that bigger size. It's also a much easier task if you are dealing with either, you know, stockinette or a clear cable pattern or something where you could easily maybe just add another repeat or two where needed. That's not what we're dealing with here because as we see, uh, let me hold up the pattern for you. Maybe you can get a sense. Basically the chart of, for this pattern is like a paint by numbers and, um, so sizing something like this up is uh, a little bit different task than just adding stitches and, you know, at the underarm or, or wherever. You, you have to figure out how those lines are going to go across the body. The other thing that I had to consider with this is there are two gauges given in the pattern. One is for mohair held single and the other is for mohair held double. As we're already seeing in the body, there are instances of mohair held singly being right up against mohair held double and sort of alternating and it's not regular, right? So how do we figure out what the gauge should actually be if we're trying to size it up? So if you bear with me here, I'm just gonna show you a little bit of pattern math. <laughs> so if I look at my pattern, my schematic for this pattern, I can see that the bust measurement is 92 centimeters total, right? Which is 46 centimeters each for the front and back. I can also see from the pattern, which is again, a very simple shape. It's straight sides on the body, you know, no increasing or decreasing, no shaping on the sides. I can see for that 46 centimeter measurement across the back in this instance, I'm working on the back, I have 96 stitches. All right, so this is what we're dealing with so far. Then we're gonna do a little bit of algebra. <laughs> Friggin' love algebra. So then I want my desired measurement of the bust divided by two. So I think I decided that I wanted about 102 centimeters. I do like wearing my sweaters with a little bit more positive ease generally than recommended. Uh, it's just my preference, especially for something like an all over mohair sweater. I don't necessarily want mohair like up in the pits. So I wanted to go a little bit on the bigger side. So for me, that is 102 centimeters is my desired finished measurement. Divided by two is 51 across the back over X stitches, right? So here's the equation, right? And if we cross multiply and then divide for X, 
we get this. <laughs> so around 106 stitches is what I need. So that's 106 stitches for the front and 106 for the back. So the chart that I have printed in this book is written for 96 stitches and I need to add 10 stitches to that. So that's really not very many stitches. I'm really not sizing this up a whole lot. So what I decided to do in this instance was to transfer this entire chart into Excel. I'm sure you could use Adobe. I'm sure there are other things out there I don't know about. I use Excel, so that's just what I do. So I outlined the shape of the body. I outlined all of these curves for, I've only done the back so far. It took a couple hours, you know, it was not an insignificant um, amount of work to do it, but this is what I did. I put the chart into Excel and then I decided where to add those stitches. So it might be tempting to add them at the underarm, but what happens when you add too many stitches at the underarm, especially since you know you're going to be also doing that on the front of the garment, if you get too many stitches around the underarm, it's going to start to affect your sleeve circumference in a way that you might not intend. Another measurement to consider, because this is a set in sleeve garment, one of the important measurements in addition to the bust is the cross shoulder measurement where you want that set in sleeve to hit um, is basically at the point of where your your shoulder meets what is this whatever part of the body this is your trap that distance will be very individual so i tend to need more of a cross shoulder i need that distance to be wider than than most patterns, honestly, but especially this pattern. So I took my cross back shoulder measurement, I looked at the measurement as indicated in the pattern, and I reasoned that if I add three stitches on either side of the shoulder, and then two on either side of the underarm for both the front and back, that should give me about what I'm looking for in terms of the finished size. So once I had my chart in Excel, I just inserted three rows for each shoulder, and I added two stitches onto either underarm. And then I just smoothed out those lines. So where those gaps were created, I just filled them in. As far as sizing this up, if you are not confident about grading patterns, or if you're really looking to size it up significantly, um, which is going to be a large portion of, of the knitting population, I would assume, what I would actually probably do myself is hack another pattern to look like this one. I think unless you are already very confident with grading patterns up from a one that was written for a very small size, that is going to set more people up for success than like trying to struggle with grading a, a small thing to, you know, one and a half plus times its original size. And so for this, it involves a little bit of creative thinking on your part. So let me show you what I would do. Going back to the original picture, let's look at the style lines. And so we know this is a set and sleeve garment. We can tell that from also the schematic, but it's getting a little bit obscured because this model is wearing like a cap sleeve t-shirt under here. We can see this is just a set and sleeve garment with a sleeve that's knit down from the top. And there's a rolled rib neckline, regular rib at the bottom of the hem and cuffs. So structurally, this is actually an extremely simple design. The really special thing about it is that very interesting intarsia pattern, right? So what I would do is choose a pattern that you know will fit you, right? Choose a pattern that you've knit already, choose something by a designer that has a track record of being able to thoughtfully construct these shapes for larger bust sizes, Elizabeth Doherty, Isolde Teague, whoever, and choose your set and sleeve design. You know, at this point you, you can expand your mind and really you could choose any type of shape. You know, any simple shape I think would work well for this. You could do a drop shoulder, whatever. And you can take that pattern and do basically what I did in Excel. You, you would plot out the number of stitches. Say you need 150 stitches cast on for the back. You can plot that out. You can use regular graph paper. You can use whatever you want. Draw out your basic shape, you know, including the armhole shaping, you know, where it says first row of the armhole shaping, you bind off four, you would move, you know, go four squares over, etc outline your shape. And then once you have that, you can draw in those sweeping lines of where you want the intarsia to go. Is that a lot of work? Yeah. Is it possibly very rewarding? Yeah. I really understand that a lot of people might not be down for this. Um, you know, you might 
for reasons of principle not want to be knitting a pattern that is not graded for any size other than this one. Um, and I think that that is completely valid. However, it's also limiting uh, in an instance like this where you are really not going to be able to find an adequate substitute for this garment that is graded up because the design is so unusual. And so if you want this sweater, but you don't fit into this garment, there are some ways that we can get around that, right? So if this is your first time knitting from a Japanese pattern, if it's your first time trying to grade a pattern up or size it up in some way, I would just not start with this one. Like choose almost, choose any other pattern, choose anything else, because the fact that this is knit in mohair, uh, held double and all of these little intarsia sections and all of that, it's sort of like a one and done situation. Like I'm really not reasonably going to be able to rip this out if there was a problem. So if you haven't done something like this before in terms of, of sizing up, I would just suggest choosing something that you would feel confident in ripping out and reusing the yarn easily and something with a simple shape. Like, I mean, a set and sleeve is, is relatively simple. Um, something like a drop shoulder is where I started with this. So if you recall a couple months back, I knit a version of this sweater. And so if we're just looking at the style lines, if we were going to consider how would we make something like this larger, this is just a simple drop shoulder. There's a cable pattern that starts just above the apex of the bust. There is a long straight sleeve that has an opening here. So you know that the sleeve would be knitted flat joined in the round for the cuff. And this is something that could easily be graded up using math to fit any size, right? Um, something like this is where I would recommend starting if you are less confident about the whole process. So in my case, the edit that I'm going to be making or hack to this pattern is uh, once I knit the body, the back and the front, and I have them sewn together, I am actually going to not follow the directions in the pattern for that top down sleeve. I'm going to go to my old trusty Elizabeth Doherty top down sleeve book. And uh, that's the math that I'm going to use to knit my sleeve from the top down. So that might be my minor pattern hack if you can consider it that. So that is how this is going so far. I will check back in with you again before this is done, certainly. Um, next time I run into something interesting or if I run into a problem, uh, like I said, I will do anything to avoid ripping this out. So one thing that I am considering, because I did size up and I'm planning to wear it with so much positive ease, there is actually a possibility that it might be too wide at the shoulder that um, depending on how the fabric behaves once I get to that point, it's a little bit hard to predict. So if it ends up being significantly too wide for a set-in sleeve, I might just turn it into a drop shoulder. I'm going to reassess that once I get to the point where I would need to start decreasing for that underarm shaping. So that's one possible way that I have in my mind that I could fix this if things start going wrong. If you've watched my videos before, you know that I like to cut into my knitting a lot, um, especially in terms of color work. I'll like cut into something to cut a new shape out or fix something or whatever, but that's not an option with this particular yarn. So uh, my usual tactics will not work here. So please let me know what you think of this little series. I'm hoping to keep it separate so that we can really do these deep dives into this type of stuff so that the regular channel episodes don't get too long. Uh, I'm just constantly in danger of talking for far too long. So that is the plan moving forward. So I think that is all that I have for you today and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.